Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Anne Oikarinen, and I'm going to talk about threat modeling and especially how to threat model user stories and epics and in, 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 well, in a DevSecOps process. And by the way, this session is interactive. So we're going to have a poll towards the end of the session where you get to try threat modeling on your own. So be ready for that. But hey, uh, in case you're wondering that who am I, um, uh, I'll say a few words. I'm a senior security consultant and at the company called Nixu. We have roughly 400 people all working in cybersecurity and we mainly operate in Europe. Our headquarters are in Finland and that's where I'm located right now. It's the middle of the night here, basically. Um, I'm sort of a security analyst. Well, it's a nice way of putting that. I like far too many things about cybersecurity. Uh, but my work boils down to helping development teams make more secure software, sometimes by threat modeling, sometimes by integrating DevSecOps tools or helping them design processes that include security. And I also participate um, into and um, facilitate, arrange, plan cybersecurity exercises. Uh, before I go to threat modeling, I will quickly explain some terminology because I know that threats and risks and vulnerabilities and attacks and things like those get often mixed up in speech. So when I talk about vulnerabilities, I mean a weakness in either configuration or code that can be exploited so, uh, by passing authentication, having too many ports open, injection, these are vulnerabilities. And when I talk Threats, I mean something, anything that has a negative impact, something that we don't want to happen. Well, it could be a storm cutting of electricity. It could be um, ransomware uh, attachment being like infecting our servers, this kind of thing. And then we, when we talk about risks, uh, it's the damage uh, or loss that, that, is, that we get if the threat actually happens. So uh, there are two impacts, uh, or two, two totally different aspects. One is the impact and how much uh, money do we lose or how severe are the losses? Do we get out of business or, or do we need to fix it for days? And the other aspect is probability or likelihood that how easy it is to perform this attack. Um, how often it will happen? Does it require special uh, like circumstances or can everybody do it? So these are the terms. So let's get to threat modeling. Uh, well, that is quickly summarized uh, thinking that what can go wrong and what can we do about it? It's not being pessimistic. Uh, it's about systemically thinking all kinds of scenarios in, in software systems. And threat modeling is also shifting to the left. Well, uh, let's think about scenario that where we have a big vulnerability in production or we suffered a data breach. So how did we end up there? Well, we could have done penetration testing to find out the weakness, but that's relatively late in the process, typically just before release. So we have spent hours, days, weeks, implementing things and now we need to go back and design it again. Let's try shifting left. Uh, we could have done uh, static code analysis or run software composition analysis to find code vulnerabilities in our own code or somebody else's code like libraries. But again, we have spent a lot of time working on the code, even if it's not ready at this point. So that's maybe wasted time and effort. Let's try shifting left. And we could have done threat modeling and we could have identified this weakness already when we were designing a feature. So no code needed yet. We can do this really, really early. So threat modeling shifts security left. And as you can see, uh, one of the benefits is that you can identify vulnerabilities 
different weaknesses really early when you're just designing stuff. You don't need code for threat modeling. You just need an idea of the feature that you're going to have. Maybe a sketch of the architecture. I really love that about threat modeling. Another benefit is that threat modeling can find things that tools or testing don't do very well. I mean, our tools are not perfect. And uh, it's really difficult to test things like processes, uh, like software development process, or some process related to user account management, things like those. And, and penetration testing takes time and, and money to do, and threat modeling is, is relatively quick. And well, I'm not saying that penetration wouldn't be useful. I actually think that the combination of threat modeling and penetration testing is the best thing you can have because threat modeling helps us to prioritize the penetration testing to the most riskiest parts of the system. So, so that's, that's where you get the best results. Typically, if you will like search for threat modeling guides, they assume that you have this system built ready and you have all the features, you have full architecture, the design is pretty much complete. And of course, if you had a ready-made system and you don't threats, this is a really useful way of, of like examining quickly that what does it, are there any weaknesses? Are there any, any flaws that should be secured somehow? But uh, if we are doing software development, it's much more useful to threat model iteratively. So we can we basically take a user story or an epic. We think about the threats in those. We implement some security controls to mitigate them. We go on and implement that story. And then in the next sprint, we take another user story and we find the threats in that part of the system. We, we maybe find out that we should change this feature a bit so to make it more secure, less risks involved, and go and implement that. So that's that's probably a lot more better in, in many cases. And if you're using definition ready and definition done in your software development process, it makes sense to define in the definition ready checklist that you should have a threat model done before you start implementation and you should have some some mitigation plans defined and maybe security testing also defined at this point. So this is how it works for uh, DevOps. Well then, how do you start doing threat modeling? Well, first thing, uh, pick a user story. Uh, well, by the way, uh, I got to say that depending on how you write your user stories, it might be that it makes sense to threat model several stories at once or even an epic. Uh, I've seen some teams do, well, they, their user stories are like tasks and the other way around. So, so you need to adjust that a bit, but the main thing is to do it in batches. So you small parts of the system at a time and threat model those. Uh, then gather the people who know about this feature, or typically developers, architects, maybe, maybe a test engineer, maybe a PO. Well, there's a balance of not involving everybody in the team because that may not be efficient. But then if you're just doing it on your own, you might not get all the ideas and all the best results. So, so try to adjust that as well. And the next step is to identify what are the important assets, data, or resources that we should protect regarding this feature. And, and that's because it, it's really difficult to protect something if you don't know that what it is actually, or it, does it even exist? So, so we want to take a look at, okay, do we have personal data involved, other sensitive data, any like important resources? Is it, for instance, important that this, this system is available all the time? Source code, credentials, certificates, these are all important assets. And as the next thing, try to identify that, is there someone who would be motivated to attack? Uh, are there any gains, like financial gains or 
or other things? Can you use that information somehow? Uh, sell it? Can you well buy buy stock or like that? But then it's another point that it could be also unintentional. That somebody could make a mistake, for example, a configuration mistake, and uh, cause harm to the security because they maybe accidentally leak some data. So not just attackers, other harm reduce as well. And as the fifth step, uh, think that what can go wrong. Uh, I will tell several methods how to do that, so don't worry if that doesn't seem obvious. But you can, you can like try to think about assets and try to think about the attackers or other harm doers. That how would they maybe would like to gain from from the data? And um, as the last thing, try to think how you would prevent those threats. Um, or, or at least detect these, that some, an attack is happening, or try, and then try to react. For example, having backups is, is something that you can also include as a mitigation. It not, just doesn't have to be a prevention. A few pointers here. Uh, well, first of all, mistakes. Security problems can happen by mistake. And, and yeah, I, I will show you uh, a few methods how to, how to do this thinking what can go wrong part. Uh, first about the mistakes, because this actually happened. Uh, for instance, you can make a tiny, tiny configuration mistake, and then cause denial of service on your own system. Oops. Or maybe you have a social engineering victim who is happy to help, leaks data on the phone, tells their password, <clears throat> maybe downloads an update, which turns out to be not an update, but um, like malware. And then they infect the entire company <laughs> workstations or something. Or maybe you have an untrained software developer who doesn't know what they're doing, doesn't know about secure coding, and then they introduce vulnerabilities by accident. <clears throat> um, or a user doing wrong things, because they don't know a process, they're really hurried, uh, in, in a hurry to do something quick, uh, that nobody has time to tell them that, but how should they actually do their job. These things happen. Just basically push the wrong button and, and <laughs> so I think it, you could then like send an email accidentally to other people containing your sensitive business data. Uh, our company has created these Nixie Cyber Bogies cards. They are available in GitHub with the game involved, so you can like use these cards to get ideas about possible attackers and other harm doers in your system. There are both intentional and unintentional attackers there. Uh, now we're going to take a look at the different threat modeling methods. There are several methods because, well, none of them are perfect. There are, some of them are more useful in, in like certain scenarios or if you're looking for certain type of threats like architectural threats. So probably you, you want to use several different methods for better cover coverage. And the first method is actually just brainstorming. Walk through all the steps of, of a feature, what, what a user can do in a system what an admin can do and try to think of the following things. Uh, first of all, is there something that is dangerous or permissive? Um, for, for example, being able to see all users in a system. Uh, imagine that if you, if you have a system that you share documents with your customers, and then if the, your customer is able to see all the other customers, so maybe that's not a good idea. Um, for privacy reasons, but then, uh, then also for contract reasons, might be that your one of your customers isn't hasn't like said that it's okay to use them as a reference. So that's one thing. Uh, or if you can upload files, that can be dangerous unless you restrict the file type so that you won't get any malware infections. Um, what about viewing health data? Um, it's really sensitive, it could be, so it, uh, it should be make, make sure that um, 
there's multi-factor authentication uh, and you cannot bypass the authentication, it's something to test test very thoroughly and there are logs available to access what information when for privacy reasons. So these are important things to, to think about. Another thing is about interfaces because being an admin is quite permissive by nature. So again, you wanna check that just anyone cannot access the admin interfaces. There's strong authentication, there are logs about the admin actions and maybe some like extra checks so you won't delete users accidentally or delete all the files or shut down the system because that would be really harmful for your availability. And as a third thing, uh, try to think that if there are several user roles in the system that is there some, some like a dangerous combination of these user roles. Uh, for example, if you a request something to be paid for you, like expense claims, and then you can also approve them. So yeah, you can like sitting on a pile of money then. Not a good idea. There are several cases where this is something you need to check. Either technically prevent the same from having these both roles, or then you can have a manual process to check that, okay, regularly that these persons don't have both of them. And after listing a few of these ideas, you can brainstorm some more threats by drawing an attack tree. Uh, attack tree visualizes what are the consequences of threats and how do you get to these threats? So um, let's imagine a web application with for help desk. I will show you an example. So the help desk person can see their customer's data to help them, they might need to check their contact info and what kind of cases they have been doing or what kind of subscriptions they have. And for to be able to do their job, the help desk gets this information. So what if somebody fishes the password the, of this help desk clerk? They get to see all that information. Or what if this help desk person is really curious and, and they start browsing all the data? like about their colleagues and maybe neighbors and celebrities. Well, not nice. Leading to information disclosure, especially if they will decide to leak that somehow. Another thing that can happen that maybe you get to upload attachments to the help desk so you can like showcase that this is the problem I have, please fix it. Um, what if you can upload something nasty? Somebody uploads malware and the help desk person opens it and oops, their computer gets infected or the entire server gets infected. Get another case. It could be ransomware that stops all the company or at least this help desk service from, from operating. Another thing that could lead to is, is having a vulnerability in the website components or the operating system. So you would then be able to, for example, uh, put in ransomware. So this is an attack tree. It, it shows what are the consequences of threats and how, what kind of weaknesses lead there. So you can build this from uh, top down, meaning that you think of a weakness and then what are the threats and what are the impacts or, or the from bottom up. So you think of a bad consequence, and then you try to think of what would lead them, lead to this. I use this a lot uh, because it helps me to see that what kind of threats we have in total and what are the linkages, and I can pick like the, the main knots in, in, the, in the tree. So this is a, seeing that there's a central threat and this is something that I need to do something about. Another threat modeling technique I like to use a lot is called evil user stories. Uh, well, you can use evil user stories also as a security test planning method. Uh, well, evil user stories would apply that, it, that it's, it's the format of as a hacker, I want to steal credit card numbers or as a disgruntled employee, I want to revenge my boss and I want to sabotage the inventory 
but you might run out of ideas that what would your hacker like to do? So I think there is something that it's easier to use. You can actually reverse your thinking and first start brainstorming that what bad should not happen. And I think this is easier. So the first step is for creating evil user stories is to think about all the assets that you need to protect in the system. So um, assets can mean data, resources, like your customer database, your um, source code, your credentials, your AWS environment, and so on. Also reputation and compliance can be assets. And as the second step, think that what bad should not happen to these assets. And you can complete the sentence, an attacker should not be able to what? Um, for example, an attacker should not be able to access our source code. Well, I have more examples of this coming up, but this is the idea. And the third step is to think, how would this actually happen? How could the act attacker get access to our source code? And also think that how would you prevent this? Uh, as we think about the, the how, how part first, how part then, um, well, maybe the attacker could guess our password to GitHub, then get access. Or if he or she steals the uh, developer laptop, all right, so how can we prevent this? We can have multi-factor authentication in GitHub. Um, we can, or we actually, well, I think everybody has now, nowadays encrypted laptop disks. So another way of preventing that if you steal it, you don't still get access to your source code. So this is, this is the idea. I'll show you some examples of evil user stories. Um, an attacker should not be able to uh, purchase items without paying if it's a web. Obviously, you want to get money. Um, an attacker should not be able to hack the site using known vulnerabilities. Or a user should not be able to see other users' personal data. Or if there are many simultaneous users, they should not be able to uh, crash the site by just like downloading several times. Or what about admins? An admin should not be able to accidentally delete files or shut down the server. So like many things that could go wrong. And this is, I think this is sometimes easier than, than, than thinking about like weaknesses first. Uh, I, and I guess I can't talk about threat modeling without mentioning Stride. It's a really popular and well-known threat modeling method. Uh, each of the letters in a Stride mean a specific threat type. Uh, and it's meant for especially, especially analyzing the architecture or data flows. Uh, but you can also use it as a thinking tool if you don't, don't have all the data flows ready yet or or if you just, well, you're tired of, tired of drawing all the data flows. So let's uh, see where the letters come from. S is for spoofing. So spoofing means faking an identity of a person or maybe a server, some other a process. So man in the middle attacks are spoofing. Mm, phishing sites are spoofing. Trying to pretend somebody else is spoofing. So actually spoofing happens quite a lot in, in the cybersecurity threat world. And T is for tampering, which means well, manipulating parameters, changing it without permission. And I have the perfect example of tampering in an XKCD cartoon. Uh, the threat actor here is the mom of the boy called Robert or little Bobby Tables. And her attack vector is a SQL injection clause, an attack against the student database, its target, and the threat is losing all the student records. And she also explains the mitigation for this tampering threat would be sanitizing database inputs. 
that you just love XKCD. <laughs> I think they're funny several times. Uh, and after the next thread, we have repu repudiation. So that means denying that you didn't do something. Uh, it's related to logs. So maybe you can actually tamper logs by removing stuff out of it. So that's that's yes, repudiation thread. Also, if, if the system doesn't create any logs, so you there's no way of seeing what what happened. That information disclosure is also something that uh, like this very typical thread. Somebody gets to see information that they shouldn't be seeing. It could be technical information, like well, version numbers that where well, we can detect that it's oh this server is vulnerable. It could be personal data, other sensitive data, lots of different information disclosure threats for data at rest and also for data in transit. And denial of service. Well, a system is very slow because of loads of network traffic or maybe disk is, full, disk is full, memory is full, it's, or it's not working at all. And then we have elevation privilege, which means, well, getting access to user role that you weren't supposed to be having. Like if you're, if you're a regular user and you get admin access, that's uh, somehow by like, browsing somewhere else, bypassing authorization, that's elevation of privilege. And, and these are well, especially useful if you have an architecture picture to take a look at. You can take a look at all the elements in the architecture. Also, you can just like brainstorming it. Okay, is there something we could tamper in the parameters? Is there something that could leak somehow? Can we spoof something? Or is there a way of checking that we are talking to the entities that we Think we're doing. Uh, then, uh, for privacy threat modeling, there's a model called Linden. It also focuses on data flows, as like Stride does. Uh, Linden does not actually catch all privacy threats, so you also want to take a look at the data lifecycle, that when it's collected, how it's handled, and when you finally get rid of the data. But the LinkedIn is a really good start, and the concepts in it are really good to understand, so I will explain them briefly. There are seven thread types in LinkedIn. One of them, information disclosure, or disclosure of information in this case, is exactly the same as in Stride. And then one of the threads, non-repudiation, that is exactly opposite as in Stride. I will actually quickly soon explain what's the deal with that. And as for the other threads, uh, well, linkability means that you can link two or more data records together and combine the data and get more info. That is not actually always a bad thing, but if you can use linkability for re-identifying people, then it becomes a privacy problem. And as you might guess, identifiability means that you can actually trace back to a person from a supposedly anonymous data set. Uh, then detectability means that you can, you can detect presence, presence of something based on, on, on information, like being able to detect that uh, someone is home based on uh, network traffic or electricity flow would be detectability. And then we have unawareness, meaning that, okay, the person using the system doesn't actually know that what are the consequences of sharing data. So that's also uh, a bad thing if something then happens that they won't really fully understand, especially if, if there are kids using the system, they might not be able to comprehend all the stuff. And then non-compliance means that, well, you don't follow security or privacy policies of that system, or you don't follow regulation related to your system. And now about the repudiation and non-repudiation. I wanted to highlight this difference because it's, it's kind of important. Often in security, repudiation is really important. That's why we have logs, that's why we monitor it. 
So we, uh, we have changed control in software development, so we can trace it who did what and when. But from the privacy perspective, uh, non-repudiation can be more important. Think about uh, anonymous online voting or off-the-record conversation, like whistleblowing. It's really important that you don't get identified and maybe then discriminated by this information that you share. Uh, both of these features can exist in the same system, but then you need to be really careful when you plan it that it, it actually works the correct way. Now, then about the threat modeling results. After using several of, of these threat modeling methods, we have, well, loads of threats and, and maybe some attack trees and some mitigations ideas and okay what what do we do with this and well you should document the threats somehow and the existing mitigations that you have of course the recommended recommended security controls that you think might be good and plus all the assumptions that you have made about the risk level or who is interested in attacking and who is not because you might want to revisit that information later or somebody continues your work. And I've actually noticed that if well, in, in, in a two weeks, you remember totally that, or forget totally that, what was this about? So <laughs> for your own sake, write it down. Uh, you can use this table type of format, like threats and attack trees uh, or attack vectors, and then what's the impact? what you should do and then the least thing you should do is put the mitigations to your backlog so they will actually get implemented things like add input validation enable multi-factor authentication for all users make sure that ops team knows we have a new log format things like that you can use other ways of documenting if, if the table doesn't work for you, but it, it's, it's good to have something that is easily editable by several people. So maybe a PDF document is not the best idea or, or like Word documents. And also like it shows the risk level because after you have done the threat model, you want to assess the risk somehow, and then the risk impacts that's how how quickly you should implement these mitigations. But hey, practice is perfect. So let's try threat modeling. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go to menti.com. I will show you this. This poll, wait a sec. So please go to menti.com, maybe your phone or laptop, and enter this code. So. Uh, 93, 74, 64, 51, and I'll, and for practicing that how this system works, we have this first question that which kitten is the cutest. So that's this way I see that how many people are in. Sorry about that, I, I, I hit the, the window. Okay, great, we have four people in. Do we get more people? You can join in, in later if we can continue. Okay, you are. Well, why is nobody voting the sad cat? That is, that is so sad. <laughs> okay, maybe we can continue. You can jump in later on. So next uh, thing, we, we are threat modeling this imaginary system. It's a security camera for home use, an IoT device. So it's simple, you have this camera sitting on your home wireless LAN. And uh, well, it, it captures what it sees. There's a web-based UI, you can configure the camera with your laptop in the same wireless LAN, and you can rotate the camera, where, where does it point, what does it uh, record? And then there's, uh, you can configure the wireless LAN settings, you can install firmware updates if there's a 
new patch and uh, it the camera also stores locally videos for some period of time but then it starts erasing them because it doesn't have like endless disk space all right so this is the starting point and now please think that what assets are important in this camera system so why should we protect so basically we have this device recording videos of your home we have this it's in a in your wireless lan you can configure the camera with the lan uh, with the browser based ui so what do you think uh, think about confidentiality and think about availability think about integrity any any guesses of what assets would be important we don't have any any answers yet so i feel hope you're still there um so what do you think about the okay now we have answers the camera itself that is good good thing because well it's a device that we want to have in our home videos uh, the confidentiality in the videos also availability of, of the videos with a security camera if their videos that exist configuration great uh, the router of course that that's something to protect as well because if it's broken or it's, it's insecure somebody could get get access to the camera firmware um, knowing if you have the camera yes uh, knowing who lives there that is something to to protect all the information recorded, well, videos, maybe passwords, the network. Okay, pictures of your house. Yeah, you're, you're really good at this. So, oh, passwords, yes, that is also a good thing. Several assets. Uh, let's think about the stride model now. So, that was the spoofing and tampering, uh, these side of threats. So, what do you think is the, is the most important stride threat for the security camera? Is it spoofing the camera or spoofing something? Is it tampering the videos? Is it uh, repudiation? You cannot deny that you saw something or you did something. You're getting a lot of votes for denial of service. Also, element of privilege. Information disclosure. Yeah. Yeah, I actually didn't specify that that uh, are there separate admin or user roles in the camera. But if there are, this is then really, really important then, because then if you're just a regular user, you may be able to just see the videos in the camera, but now you would, if you can access admin, you can maybe do videos or point the camera somewhere else. So not, not really cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the vote. I think actually that it's, it's hard to say that which of these isn't because some of this is for sort of an opinion question anyway. But I think spoofing could be also spoofing you, or you can maybe you can spoof the wireless LAN, and then the camera would connect to a different LAN entirely. You can hack it. Tampering videos might might happen if you can delete something. That okay, that's embarrassing. You want to delete yourself out of the videos? Why not? Or you can tamper the login parameters and get there. Mm -hmm. Let's think about new development. Uh, the Acme IO, the company who's developing the camera, have been thinking that users might want to have new features this camera. So they are thinking that the camera should actually upload the videos to their cloud service. So the camera now has a new new configuration options. It, you can set a, a password and username so it will upload the videos to cloud service. And with this comes the possibility of viewing the videos anywhere with any device, basically with a browser. And if you know the username and password, you can get to see the videos. For example, for example, if you have the security camera at your like cottage or some, some other property that you're not currently in, you can check that, okay, is it still secure and, and safe and nobody's trespassing or anything. And yeah, of course, those videos are now stored for longer periods of time. 
in the cloud service. So what do you think, what threats are relevant to this video cloud access now? So you can watch the videos from anywhere. You cannot edit them though, or split them, just watch them. Uh, videos are uploaded to someplace else. They're not locally there anymore. Okay, uh, you're voting that everybody's videos leaked. That's true if there's a large vulnerability or misconfiguration in the uh, cloud system. Yeah, that's, that's a really big threat actually seeing somebody else's videos, if you can guess password, if you fish with somebody's password, maybe you're targeting one person that you you want you are sort of wanting to see somebody in, into somebody's home as you're stalking someone. Um, actually, uh, well, that's may not be possible, or it's at least, at least not that easy to delete videos because well, there's no user use end user feature for that. But of course, if, if somebody can, can hack the Acme IO servers and then delete all the videos, and then maybe naturally then, then it's, it's a, a relevant threat. Uh, yeah, I think, think all, all of these are uh, quite relevant. Hopefully the admins watching the videos for fun is not that likely, but well, we can only assume. They're doing really good. Uh, then let's try the evil user story method. So that was an attacker should be able to do what? And then you think about the important assets that we talked about in the first question. So you can think both of the new development and the old development. So we have this camera system sitting locally, which records videos in the wireless LAN, and then it uploads the videos to the cloud, uh, it deletes, it keeps like overwriting local videos. You can configure it in the wireless LAN and that. So what do we have? We can, okay, cool. An attacker should not be able to access videos in the cloud. Yes, that's right. The attacker should not be able to turn off cameras. That is really good as well. Well, it's a security camera. It's useless if it doesn't work. Uh, access the videos without a username and password. That is really true if you can if the authentication mechanism has flaws like that it's it's really a bad thing uh yes that's a really good answer to send software to cameras yes we don't want somebody tampering with the firmware maybe it, we can turn the all the cameras to a botnet uh, what else can you think of you can vote multiple times uh, what about the location of the camera? Location is the whole. Think something about that. I think you mentioned that it was one of the assets, like knowing, knowing that this. Okay, I think you should not be able to view the username and password in plain text. Also correct. It could be that it's some for some reason stored in a very weak way. It could maybe just uh, if we re like check the the file system of that camera, if we're able to plug it in the USB. Um, uh, had metadata on the images, that should, should not be possible. That's a good thing. Maybe we, that's that's something we don't want to take care of. Find the geolocation of the videos, not a good thing either. What about the video, like remote video storage in the cloud? Change camera configuration. So attacker should not be able to change that. Correct, yes. Uh, yeah, someone should not be able to delete the storage. Hopefully they have backups of all this information. Uh, also, we probably won't want the attackers being able to deface the website and then, well, in, inject some crypto mining scripts or malware delivery scripts. Um, we don't want the attacker to leak the videos, that's right. We don't want to upload random stuff to the storage. That's also a really good good point. That how can we control that this is actually like valid stuff? 
uh, watch videos and, and blackmail. That's that's also very very relevant if 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 you were able to know that okay, some interesting person has this this model of camera, and then we would try to guess their their passwords and get in, or maybe maybe even try to hack hack the whole whole site just to be able to get that one person's videos. But if we know that all the celebrities are using that that vendor security camera, ooh, must be really interesting. I I saw and see that you are really really good at this this stuff. Uh, move laterally from the camera to the network. Also a very good point. Awesome, really good. Uh, then this is sort of a, like an opinion type of question. If you think about the development and operations of the camera, what do you think that what what of these threats are likely to happen? Uh, is it extremely unlikely or extremely likely that there's a new vulnerability in the in a latest release or some developer is browsing personal data while they're trying to debug uh, uh, some like reported feature or or like reported bug? What do you think? Or what about the likelihood of somebody creating a backdoor? Okay, you think that, okay, uh, the most likely ones would be configuration, configuration error causing the last service. And the next one, operations not noticing a data breach. Well, well, if you read the news, this sounds very, very likely things. Um, and that's the next one, operations not noticing availability issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, now we have different votes. Okay, but still the denial of service is the, is the leading one. Okay. Uh, this might be difficult to estimate. And uh, this is actually what showcases that when you do re try to estimate the risks related to the threats, it might be really, really confusing sometimes. But how do you how do you actually know that how likely it is for some some threat to happen that or how easy it is to perform an attack it, it might be that you need to seek some information elsewhere also the impact part might be quite difficult sometimes that this is actually a big thing to fix or is this just a minor thing you may not know unless until you actually have that problem in front of you but of course, if you have historical data, uh, well, like some some cases have been happening to you, uh, well, are all are like near near cases that may be actual incidents. You might be able to sort of say that okay, we almost we had this configuration like last month, and we've we've had these vulnerabilities now and then in this library we use. So it, it's going to be like probable, almost certain that this happens. But sometimes it's it's for guesstimates. Okay, but for denial of service as the most likely thing. So what about the mitigations? How would we protect this system? The camera, the cloud service, the users, the wireless LAN. How can we protect this system, make it more secure, how somehow prevent these threats that you've been finding or detect them, react to them. Okay, first one, we have encryption. Yes, if we can encrypt the uh, video storage both locally and remotely, secure passwords, that's, that's a good thing. We can try to uh, tell the users when they're registering that, okay, this is how strong your password is. So maybe you could make it a bit more stronger. Uh, Multi-factor authentication is also a really good thing, especially for administrators, you should have that. Maybe you can recommend that to all users because that's kind of sensitive data that you might be seeing. Uh, authentication, of course, in all steps and, and like repeatedly, if you're doing, doing configuration changes, maybe you need to re-authenticate. Limiting types of uploads, that's a good thing. Encrypting at rest and also encrypting at in transit. So you 
you maybe want to test that it's the secure connection or supposedly secure connection between the camera and the cloud actually secure you're using secure algorithms there's no misconfiguration or anything yes okay scrubbing metadata really good uh, monitoring uptime yes you the ops would get alerts every time there seems to be some problem so they can they be proactive network subnetting mm -hmm. so you can prevent like getting into to other servers to other networks um, logging access yes a good thing that pro pre protects from the reputation threats updates yes updating all, all the possible uh, components if they have vulnerabilities backups excellent security policies really good thing it's it's something that you cannot always have technical control so you should maybe have policies telling what the admins can do what kind of uh, maybe you can even have ndas for them so yeah and, and limiting the devices they can use and all that did i miss something from your uh yeah not storing user info that is a good thing uh although i think we cannot limit it like fully because well the videos are our user info if, if there are persons in the video i guess we don't know that for sure if it's an empty home or can does it show people that's so, so we i guess we can't blur out the persons but yeah if you can minimize it as much as possible that's a good thing Randomizing device login. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you are. Yeah, I think you have found loads of loads of mitigations. I don't know what to add actually. Maybe uh, camera firm, firmware integrity checks. Mm, randomizing MAC addresses. Yes, that's that could also work. Yeah, certificate pinning maybe to the device so it doesn't connect to just any cloud service, if you can't do man in the middle attacks. Really good. I, I'm really pleased to see your, your answers. I, uh, both for two reasons, you are very active and also that you seem to be very good at threat modeling. So, so we were able to find multiple threats in this system. Uh, information disclosure, leaking videos, leaking some user information, um, users not being able to access the videos either locally or remotely. Um, what else? Somebody tampering with the camera configuration, uh, somebody tampering with, with firmware, malware on, on people's computers. So yeah, lots of threats that we should mitigate somehow, try to prevent them. So I tried to at least detect something from blogs. Uh, thanks, thanks everyone for, for participating. Uh, as the last question, actually, if you can give me some feedback, I would be very pleased about that, but I will continue the presentation meanwhile. So, Shot modeling truly shifts security left. Uh, we can identify problems very early with threat modeling, even before we code anything. And that I think that is really cool. Uh, threat modeling also complements our security tooling, static code analysis, software composition analysis, all those dynamic analysis tools. It helps us detect security problems in, in things that are really difficult to test, like processes, also, if it's a really big thing or it would be slow. Also, some errors do not show show up in testing. It might need some special circumstances or or if if it's like a logical flaw. And when you're starting threat modeling, I think you should start quite small and then expand. Maybe start with one method and then uh, use it for a while and then pick another threat modeling method. You don't need to set very high goals on the first time modeling because you will learn it by, by doing. Um, for example, if you're using Stride, 
you can have a goal that you will find at least one of all the threats or one one threat per type or if you're using evil user stories you can have a goal that okay for each asset that we have let's create one evil user story and then try to expand and if you identify something that you should well maybe add more security controls change the feature somehow to make it less risky so put them to your backlog so you won't forget to implement thank you everyone i i had a great time i will now maybe have time to check the chat that we have any any questions there you can you can keep asking we have some some more time and if you don't have any questions now but they you pop up later you can connect me in linkedin or twitter i'd be pleased to chat with you about threat modeling and, and other things as well so so don't hesitate to contact me I uh, see from the comments that you, you enjoyed the, the poll, so so I really like that. So what helps, that's a question, what helps you to think uh, in more attack vectors? Um, that is a really good question. I, I think that's, well, well, I, I, I got to say that I have a fairly technical background that I also been doing security testing, so that helps to see uh, some kind of like, this is a typical weakness. Also, it helps to see, like, like, for example, read read like news about different different attacks. If you have threat intel info that you see, it you can well check that. Okay, now there are it's it's a trend that there are certain types of attack groups doing certain types of attacks, or you uh, hear about and data breaches it helps like helps like clicking things in your head that, okay this could actually happen in our system as, as well also if you try to think all the like what's in there in the system that how what are the ways in so the attack surface do you have user interface do you have apis how many apis are there internal or external so think of all those what kind of request can you send? So that's sort of, you can then try to think that, okay, how would I abuse this, this API or this feature? Also thinking about the, the users. So that's, that's yeah, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's slightly difficult to explain. Uh, good sources to cybersecurity specific news. That's also, um, a good question. Uh, I have I've been using. Well, I think what would I say actually? Because I have been using Feedly to search search like different kinds of topics. Actually, like um, I have the, oh my god, I have this outage in my head. What is the site called? Oh my god, I can't remember the, the name of the new site. I'm, I'm usually browsing that it's. That is really odd. I think I'm, I might answer that later <laughs> because I have this total blackout right now. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, well, thread post is, is something that you can use. And then, and then, then dark reading. I also read news in that. I, well, I think there's no like one news site that would be, now I remembered it, it's called The Register. I like to read that. It's also other, other, I can't remember why, how, how could I forget that name? <laughs> but I like to read that. I also like the way they, they like write their headlines. They're sort of, sort of witty. But yeah, uh, maybe, and also probably you pick like, uh, your some sources that are specific to your the field that you're working in. If you are working in the financial field, for instance, then financial news, also uh, IoT, industrial IoT things. So, so then probably these are more interesting to you. So uh, it could be it could be also that 
not always free sources available. So some commercial commercial threat intel feeds might get you something that is really specific to you. But yeah, I, I see we are getting links and, and website names to the chat. So that's awesome for help, helping me out because I was totally unprepared for this question. I, uh, okay, tech, I, I need to check that as one, one as, as well. Anything else you want to ask? Just shoot. I know that though that we are sort of running out of time and there are new sessions starting. So if you want to go for another session, that's that's right. Okay. Okay. I think I'll end this session now. Thanks for all joining and for participating. Uh, I had a really good time. See you later. Bye.